The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon to everybody here on the lovely East Coast, and good morning to everybody else out there in the United States. Um, hope you guys are all having a great day. Thank you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon slash morning uh, to learn more about our uh, new product, Mechanite, uh, which we're very excited uh, to launch out and to provide to all you out there throughout the country. Um, so I'm not sure, I can't see hands here, unfortunately, because we're all sitting here at our computer screens, but uh, this should complement uh, Rich Cartier's webinar yesterday uh, about Emerald Ash Borer. Um, so there'll be some crossover, but not terribly too much. Um, but yeah, so we're ready to get started um, as just a kind of few housekeeping items here. As you all know, this webinar is worth one CEU. Um, if you are unable, this is an ISA CEU that is, if you're unable to put in your CEU uh, code or ISA number at the time that you register for this webinar, you can do that now uh, simply by um, putting it in, opening up this little chat screen um, and putting it into this chat screen, or you can also put it into this little question screen here. So if you expand out this little go to meeting box here by pushing that little arrow, you'll get the full um, dialog box here. So you could put your ISA uh, CU certification numbers into there. Um, likewise, if you have any questions, during the course of the webinar today, please put them into that little question box here. So again, you can expand this little question box by clicking on that little arrow, type your questions into there. Into there, um, We have Matt Karst helping us out today. So Matt is up there in uh, outside of Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm sitting down here in lovely North Carolina. Uh, so Matt will be helping us today uh, in reading off any questions uh, at the end of the webinar. And, uh, and we'll answer those questions at the end of the webinar, so not during the webinar. Um, so hold on for questions if you have any at the end there. So my name is Patrick Anderson. I am an arborologist with Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancement. Uh, I've been working for Rainbow now for a little, uh, close to five years. Um, and I have a great job. My job is to travel around the country and work with all of you guys and gals out there in the field providing training and support uh, with uh, tree and shrub healthcare protocols. You can see my information there. Um, as you know, we also have this awesome tech support line where if you have questions about a product, uh, need help with diagnosing a problem, um, you can call that tech support line. You will talk to a live human being during regular hours um, in central time. Uh, but we pride ourselves on getting back to you. And again, our tech support is second to none really when it comes to uh, helping you guys out there with products and protocols for tree and shrub care. As a quick reminder, I'm sure most of you all on this webinar today are aware of saluting branches. Uh, know though that we have our fifth annual saluting branches coming up on September 18th. Um, again, if you're not familiar with Susan Branches, this is a day of service where arborists through all out the country um, give a day of service to Veterans Affairs Cemeteries. Um, so this is every September, third Wednesday in September, and we just have arborists and landscape managers throughout the entire country volunteering at some of these underserved Veterans Affairs Cemeteries. Um, it's a great time. It's a really good cause. Um, last year, we had over 2,500 volunteers, and that's just so powerful to me to think of having 2,500 um, tree people uh, and landscape people all working together on the same day throughout the entire country. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, learning where your nearest cemetery is or how else you could help, you can go to solutionbranches.com. Um, I'd highly encourage you to go out and check that out. So as you know, Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements, everything we do is based in science. Um, and I always like to show slides like these. And I know if you're on the webinar yesterday, Rich showed this slide, but I always like to just kind of, you know, set the stage for what we're about to talk with. But everything we do here is based in science and research. Um, so just as an example alone to our commitment to research in our field. And again, this research is keyed in on tree and shrub care. So there's very few private institutions out there that are concentrating their full research power on tree and shrub care to help our industry and to help take care of trees and shrubs um, better. 
um, and find new ways to do this. Um, so just last year alone, we did over 150 uh, research trials. Uh, we're going to probably match that or exceed that this year um, with our research and development department and our key partners out there. Just an example of some of those, you can see their logo there on the right side of the screen. As you know, to date, we've created over 160 protocols. So these protocols are involved, again, with tree and shrub care, so managing trees and shrubs in the suburban and urban interface that we're all working in. Um, we all know these poor trees and shrubs. They're going under all kinds of challenges, um, you know, weather extremes, insects, pests. Um, native and exotic today, of course, we'll cover over both native and exotic pests that we can help to manage with nectonite, um, but also know that we provide all kinds of training as far as in the field training support. Uh, so anything we can do to help you um, with your plant healthcare department uh, and your operations, we provide marketing support as well. Um, so if you need ideas to help grow your plant healthcare department, we're here to help. Um, you know, again, that's our mission. We want to do everything we can um, to help save trees and help you do that. Um, and of course, our rainbow company values. Um, this is one of the rare kind of webinars we do, or this is really a product focused webinar. Uh, we'll be talking almost exclusively about mechanite. Um, but again, know that the two things I always like to call out are the science based. So again, everything that we're discussing here uh, is based in trial research and the honesty and integrity. Uh, we hold that really, really true. So, you know, if it's not the best choice, we'll tell you it's not the best choice. If it is the best choice, then sure enough, we'll tell you that as well. So what we are gonna talk about today, of course, is we're gonna talk about what is mechanite. Again, we're really excited to, to be launching mechanite here and have this uh, offered out there to the world and to all you guys to help, uh, uh, and gals to help save trees out there. Um, so we're gonna go through the product details. We're gonna look at some operational efficiencies with mechanite, so reasons why you would wanna use mechanite. Uh, and again, there'll be a little crossover from what Rich discussed yesterday, if you are on his webinar. Um, and then what we're going to do is we are going to key in on some common landscape tests that um, are really well managed using mechanite. So, um, and you can see there the four categories where mechanite really stands out, uh, boars, caterpillars, beetles, and spider mites. Uh, of course, you know, we all know mectonite as a product for emerald ash borer. Of course, we'll discuss emerald ash borer because you can't discuss mectonite without emerald ash borer. But you may be surprised at, um, you know, some of these other tests that we can control really well using mectonite. So we'll discuss that and then, of course, we'll, we'll wrap everything up and we'll get it out of here within an hour or so. Uh, and again, anytime you have any questions, please put them into that question box. So what is mectonite? So mectonite is the uh, is formulation of 4% M-mectin benzoate. It comes in a one quart bottle. And you can see here where we have a uh, really nice dosing chamber. This was, you know, we always ask for feedback. One of our um, values is ongoing improvement, uh, which I didn't call out, but that's one of our values is this continuing and ongoing improvement. And so when we were, you know, developing this product, one of the questions we had was, you know, what do you like? What do you not like about some of the other products available? And the one thing that we got back was um, people like using this larger dosing chamber. So we were able to provide a larger dosing chamber on mechanite. So this is a four ounce dosing cha chamber or 120 milliliter dosing chamber. Um, and it's marked off in de mark de <laughs> sorry, demarcations every um, half an ounce uh, to, or 10 milliliters. And again, this is feedback that we got uh, and again, this helps folks to um, reduce exposure um, because they can use this dosing chamber and not have to pour into um, another dosing chamber. Though, of course, um, you know, using something like a graduated cylinder in milliliters is going to give you more precise dosing, uh, just to acknowledge that. But this was something that um, everybody was really anxious to have and ask for, and so we were able to provide that. So really happy about that. Uh, Mectonite is, has a Signal caution word, it is a non-restricted use pesticide, um, which is also really nice for a lot of folks out there, um, either due to what their safety regulations are internally or some of our clients out there, um, they don't want us using restricted use pesticides out there on sites. So mectinite allows us to have a, a very effective mmectin benzoate product um, that is non-restricted use um, and carries that caution signal word, which of course is 
um, one of the lower signal words out there. Um, as far as the data, and we'll look at a lot of this data here later on in the presentation, um, efficacy with mechanite, um, it is demonstrated as equivalent to the original triage as well as arbumectin. Um, we see uptake speeds are equal to arbumectin, and that is really one of the key distinctions with mechanite is its uptake speed. And we'll look at this here in just a moment or so. Um, it is very low viscosity. It's a low viscosity formulation. So basically what that means is that it gets into the tree um, quicker. We're able to inject it into the tree faster. Uh, and because of the low viscosity, we're able to use our uh, plugless injection equipment very effectively. Uh, so we don't see the need to use plugs when using mechanite. Um, we also see the uptake is equal to or faster, in many cases faster than both the original formulation of triage as well as triage G4. Now again, mechanite is designed to be used in a variety of different refillable injection equipment. So of course we have our Q suite, including here as we head down our uh, IQ infuser, which of course is a battery operated variable action pump unit. Um, we're not gonna get too much into equipment in this webinar, but it works very well in this piece of equipment. And of course the variable action pump, what that does is that um, forces, or excuse me, pushes product into the tree um, at a variable speed as opposed to just punching it all in at one high speed. So this only pushes product into the tree uh, against its back pressure, so just above back pressure. So this reduces um, some collateral damage that we see with other high pressure injection equipment. Uh, we can also use it in our Q Connect unit, which of course is our harness unit, where you are applying pressure using a simple bicycle pump, no special pump there. And then it could also be used in our Q gun, though at rates where we recommend for Emerald Ash Borer, um, you're gonna be a lot happier using one of these two pieces of equipment over the Q gun. And of course it can be used, as I mentioned, it's designed to be used in any other piece of refillable injection equipment available out there on the market. So um, if you already have invested in some kind of injection equipment, um, that isn't our key suite, you can certainly use it in that. Um, and if you're looking for new injection equipment, then um, you know, the Q suite is a great option. Again, we utilize plugless technology. Um, and this is part of the reason why we can use plugless technology is the viscosity. So if we compare the viscosity of the other um, MMEC and Benzoate products available out there on the market, at least the most common ones available out there on the market, you can see that mechanite and arbormectin are very similar in viscosity here. So um, less than about you know, three to four stenostokes here uh, in viscosity versus the original triage formulation, which you can see here is 38 stenostokes, so significantly higher than um, our mechanite or arbormectin formulation. And then finally, um, if you compare that to triage G4, which is less viscous than the initial, the original triage formulation, um, then you can see here that we are almost, we're less than about half the viscosity of that. So that is the, one of the biggest key distinctions with mechanite is that low viscosity allows us to get the product up into the tree a lot faster. And of course, if we're treating a lot of ash trees in any given year or a lot of any of these trees, and every given year, then you know time accounts for a lot here. So what this table is looking at here is comparing the speed of injection for arbormectin, nectinite, and triage. Um, and so there is an average of four trees per treatment here. And although the average for mectinite is faster than arbormectin, they're um, not significantly different when you do the statistics, but they are significantly different when compared to the original triage formulation. So again, you can see here that with mectinite, we can, on average, we're getting um, product into the tree in just over six minutes. And on average at triage, we're just over 30 minutes. Again, these are slightly larger trees. But again, this demonstrates the speed of getting mectinite into the tree. And that's really, as I said before, that's probably our biggest key distinction with mechanite. So low viscosity, it makes its way into the tree a lot faster. 
Uh, this is just kind of looking at a comparison using different pieces of equipment and mectinite, and then in this case is here, comparing that to the original triage formulation. Uh, and so you can see that across the board, um, using different pieces of equipment, you're still getting product up into the tree a whole lot faster than we would be um, using some of these original formulations of emmectin benzoate. And again, the distinction there is if you're treating a whole, whole lot of trees, um, we're going to have a lot faster time getting stuff in. We're going to be able to treat more trees. It's going to be more profitable because as you guys know, that you know, labor here is what's going to really drive prices. So more profitable, save more trees, everybody's winning, which is great. Um, if we look at this now, now, as you guys know, we are, um, we come from a tree care company. So um, for those of you who do not know the history of Rainbow, uh, we started in the 70s and we originally, our whole purpose was to go around and do preventative treatments for Dutch elm disease um, on elm trees, obviously. Uh, that has since grown. And as we sit here today, Rainbow Tree Care, our service side of the company, is the largest tree care company in the Twin Cities up if they're in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and we are fortunate to take care of a lot of ash trees. And we have for years now, uh, when emerald ash borer uh, found its way to that area of the country. And so if you can compare here, the total number of inches treated per season. So if we look here, the total number of inches treated per season, and then the total on-site labor hours, comparing um, triage G4, which our service company has used for um, several years prior to bringing on uh, the mectinite formulation or using the mectinite formulation, you can see here that we are looking at, um, we'll just say those round numbers here, 270,000 inches treated with triage G4 and 445,000 total inches treated with mectinite, the mectinite formulation. So again, not quite double, but a lot more inches. But if we look now at our on-site labor hours, so we're not quite treating double the amount of inches of DBH with the mectinite formulation. But if you look at our hours, you would expect that our hours would be about doubled. Uh, again, not quite, but our hours using the mechanite formulation over the triage G4, you can see we're not far off hours wise, even though we treated almost double the amount of inches of diameter. And the reason for this is, um, is part, well, part of the reason for this is that viscosity. Uh, again, mechanite is close to um, half the viscosity of that triage G4, so it moves into the plant faster. So as in this example, and again, some of this, you know, we're talking about obviously here, you know, hundreds, thousands of inches of trees, you know, acknowledging that not everyone out here might be treating this number of trees, but it's a pretty good case study to show just how much faster we can do these treatments using the mechanite formulation over um, some of these other and mectin benzoate out there. Um, now, the other cool thing here is because these, this formulation is so much less viscous, especially compared to some of the original formulations of M mectin benzoate, we don't need to use plugs with this. There's no need to use plugs with the mectinite formulation. So if you were to do the math to figure out how many plugs one would need to use when treating this many inches of diameter here, it was over $100,000 in plugs alone that we saved money on um, because of using a less viscous formulation. So the key take homes using this slide here are mechanite is less viscous, it moves into the tree very quickly, and because of that viscosity, that that low viscosity, we just don't have a need to use plugs. Um, so again, using plugs is an additional cost. So again, we're saving some money. We're again, we're being um, less potential wounding to the tree. Um, 
and we're helping trees. So in this case here, I know uh, Rich covered this yesterday in his webinar, so I won't go into this too much, but you know, this is starting to become reported in the news more and more, um, this collateral damage um, with using plugs. So, you know, putting, setting a plug is just one more kind of factor in your equation. Being able to take that factor out of your equation, again, gives us a little um, less that can go wrong out there and save us some more time. So we won't need to go into that. Um, but of course, it's just a huge benefit to not have to set those plugs. Um, and again, the other part of this too is knowing when we talk about speed of uptake and efficacy, um, a lot of this also talks, it, it is related to um, where we make our injections. And so if you were to review ISA's best management practices for trunk injection, uh, what you would find is according to our best management practices, and again, this is backed up by research, uh, replicated research, is that ideally what we want to do is we want to be injecting as low down onto that root flare, the trunk flare, whatever you prefer to call it, um, as low down on that area as possible. And there's several reasons for that. The first reason is one, is we have a wider area of active xylem in this um, portion of the plant. So again, just from a physically speaking, we can get more product into this active area the further down we go. Using plugless technology, we only have to go three quarters of an inch to one inch past that bark into this area. So we don't need to go that deep and we are hitting more of this kind of active xylem tissue the farther down we go. So that's one reason that helps our speed and uptake. That's also gonna help with our distribution because again, what we have found is that the lower you get down here, if you're into this root flare area, you're getting better radial distribution around the tree, which means you're getting product more reliably up into the canopy and all portions of the canopy. Whereas if you go up higher, one is we have less active xylem, we have smaller vessels, so we might actually hit inactive xylem, in which case, again, that could be an issue with distribution and uptake. Our vessels in the xylem tissue are narrow, more narrow than they are down here, so that is an uptake issue there. That slows our uptake speed. And then finally, we don't get as good radial distribution, so we might not get full product um, up into that canopy. So these are some of the reasons why we always want to be down here in that root flare. And then finally, um, research has shown that this portion of the tree will seal over one and a half times faster than up here on the trunk. So that is also a nice little distinction. You know, if we're injecting early on in the season, by the time we get to late summer or fall, if we're injecting down this portion of the tree, often that wound is sealed uh, versus if we're up here higher on the tree, it just doesn't seal as fast. So some good distinctions there as to why we want to inject lower down on the trunk. But now kind of the meat of what we're here to talk about today is what else can we use mectinite for? So again, most people think of mectinite as an emerald ash borer product. And of course, we can't not talk about emerald ash borer when we're talking about mectinite. Um, but mectinite can be very effective on a host of other insects. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the ones we put out here, like fall webworm, gypsy moth, Japanese beetle. Uh, this is one that not many people are aware of, which is really exciting. Uh, a lot of our different caterpillars. Um, flathead borer, obviously, outside of, of um, emerald ash borer. And then clearwing borer, which we have not had a really good systemic product for clearwing borers. Uh, but we do with mectinite, um, which is nice. And so we'll start covering over some of that stuff here uh, in a few moments. Uh, but again, as I mentioned, everything we do here is back in research. So you can see this is just an example of some of the trials we did. And this is not you know, a list of all of our trials. We've had various trials of different size over the years using mectinite and other formulations of other products. Uh, but this is just some of the examples of some of the research that we will look at here today. Um, and again, we have a lot of great results using the mechanic formulation on a host of these pests here. Now, of course, um, I can't just jump into um, doing pest protocols without 
always putting things into context. So, you know, the idea of shooting first and asking questions later, um, that's just not the right approach to, uh, to plant healthcare, IPM, uh, traditional IPM. So before we talk about pest protocols, I always like to put it in context of what we're actually doing out there. Uh, and I always like to refer to this article that was published a long time ago now, back in 1999 by John Ball, where he uh, talks about the appropriate response process. And the appropriate response process is really about setting action thresholds of damage. So, you know, at what point do we need to treat? And then going through this cycle of, you know, monitoring our trees and shrubs, making proper diagnosis, so making sure we're diagnosing the right problem, and diagnosing the right problem would then dictate the right course of action to take, whether it be foliar application, trunk injection, soil application, things of that nature. Uh, and then, of course, doing things to prevent any kind of damage to trees. And finally, you know, when we go through this process, when we reach an action threshold where we need to do some kind of control making sure we're, create, we're using that toolbox approach um, and doing what's best for the tree, the site, and of course, what's gonna be most effective against that pest. So with that context in mind, we will roll into some common pests that we can use mechanite for. Uh, and as I mentioned, of course, with emerald ash borer, you can't have a talk about mechanite without discussing emerald ash borer, um, and of course, I would encourage you to listen to Rich Cartier's webinar from yesterday. You can find that on our YouTube channel. You can find our YouTube channel through our website, treecarescience.com. Uh, he did a great overview of this pest. Um, I'm just gonna do a little small overview of the pest um, and basically here just discuss our life cycle here. Um, but as you guys know, emerald ash borer will affect all of our native ash tree species or fractional species. It also has been uh, found that it can complete its life cycle in our native white fringe tree as well, though it is definitely a secondary host, not considered a primary host at this time, uh, but something to be aware of, especially uh, if anyone's out there, uh, city planners or landscape architects. Um, seems like, at least in my part of the country, white fringe tree was finally becoming a popular choice, and unfortunately now we might have a press of it. Um, but again, animal ash borer has uh, one generation per year, depending upon where you are in the country. It can take up to two seasons for the life cycle to happen, though. Uh, they emerge early on in the season, about 400 to 500 growing degree days. Uh, theologically speaking, that's right around when black locust bloom. You can find black locusts just about everywhere, uh, at least uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and then they peak at about 1,000 growing degree days. Uh, of course, right around then is when they will do some maturation feeding on the leaves. They'll find some notching on the leaves, though, of course, that's not a big issue. It doesn't cause much damage, just a few notching feeding areas for the adults before they mate. And then they lay their eggs in underneath, like, the plates and the bark. So you would probably never see these eggs unless you are really got your hand lens out and are poking around underneath bark. Those legs hatch after a few days, and then we have our several instars. And of course, this is what's doing the damage is the larvae there. And you can see traditional looking flat-headed larvae. As they grow, they feed more and more, more gregariously. And this is what actually kills the tree, of course, is this S-shaped serpentine pattern uh, as packed with frass. And that's what kills the tree. And then, of course, in the early spring, they begin to pupate, and then the whole cycle starts over again. Now, when we talk about products, and again, I would encourage you to listen to Rich Cartier's webinar from yesterday. He has a really great product overview here. Um, but we always think about treating for emerald ash borer. We think about these low-risk preventative treatments and then high-risk preventative treatments or, again, high-risk therapeutic treatments. And so in these outlying trees, so trees that are close to, you see here, within 15 to 25 miles of a known EAB infestation and that are 25 inches and less in diameter, we are really confident in using some of these traditional um, insecticides like Transtec as a basal bark spray or Zytec in the fall and or spring as a soil injection. And again, I always say when you're using these products here, it is the early and often method. You wanna be there before the pest is in the tree and you wanna do it every year. Ideally, we see um, in the spring with Transtec, Certainly in the spring with Zytec, you can do in the fall or spring. Um, but again, it's not statistically different, but it always 
seems that the dive tech in the spring um, looks a little better than the one in the fall. But when we were in this area, these products were great. Early and often, Transpec and Zytec, great choices, especially for trees 25 inches or less in diameter. When we get into these higher risk trees, so this is where we either have an, a known infestation right next to a tree. We might suspect that the tree is already infested up to 15 miles. This is when we're doing our high risk preventative or therapeutic treatments. And this is where mectinite, of course, shines here. Um, so this is where we just see um, really great results using mectinite. And again, we're seeing at least two seasons of control using mectinite. So again, just an example, and Rich covered over on this yesterday. Um, so again, I would encourage you to look at his um, webinar, find on our website, truecarescience.com or on our YouTube page. Uh, this is an example of what our treatments would look like. And so mectinite, we can do trunk injections. Um, once we have about three quarter leaf development, all the way up until we have fall color change um, and we start getting leaf drop. So we can inject throughout the entire season with mectinite. And again, because of that low viscosity, it really helps us to get product into the tree, especially when we get later on in the season, it might be more difficult with other formulations there. If we look at some of the data, um, cause gosh, don't we just love looking at uh, charts on here, but you know, it's really important to review this data to understand what we're seeing here. So if we look here, this is um, looking at emerald ash borer um, exit holes and galleries, uh, as well as dieback. And so if we look at our untreated versus our mectinite formulation, if we look at um, year two and we look at galleries in the tree, we have significantly less galleries in the tree compared to our untreated controls here. Likewise, if we look at exit holes, so the exit holes are, of course, the adults coming out, not insects going in, but of course, the adults coming back out. We see here with our mectinite formulation, year one, we have no exit holes. And year two, we have no exit holes versus our untreated, we have eight and 15 exit holes. And this is a good example too of how uh, populations can expand with EAB, where we have almost doubled the amount of exit holes in year two as it is year one. Looking at some pictures to show what this looks like in real life here. So here you can see these trees or ash trees treated with mectinite formulation. These trees are left untreated in this trial. And this is with Purdue. Um, and again, you can see the difference here. These trees um, look just fine. Well, these trees are, for the most part, dead at this point. Looking at another trial site here, we have our untreated tree with our treated plant here with our mectinite formulation. Again, just to kind of drive this point home, that this is very effective. Um, this mectinite formulation is well trialed, well studied, um, and is a great tool for you. Uh, here again, another picture. This is up there in Michigan, Grand Rapids, Michigan. So, you know, a lot of these sites we're looking at, these are places where emerald ash borer is a major issue. And we have high populations. So we're not talking about some low population sites, high population sites with dead trees close by. Again, untreated versus our treated. And again, if we look at this chart here, what we're seeing, if we compare our untreated to the mechanite formulation to triage, which everybody at this point know works very well. You know, we compare here. We are right there. We are below, in this case here, by year six, the trees are starting to recover. We're below 20% canopy dieback, where our untreated trees are above 60% canopy dieback on their way out in this case here. Now, of course, emerald ash borer, uh, it's a boring insect. Um, not that you know it'll put you to sleep, but it bores in the trees. And there are other boring insects that are closely related to this. So the genus of emerald ash borer is a gryllus, uh, which is the same genus as some of our other native boring insects, um, specifically two-line chestnut borer, which we can see right here, and bronze birch borer, as we can see right here. Um, again, these trees, or excuse me, in this case here, these pests are usually coming after already trees that are predisposed to some stress. Um, but again, we're going to get great control on these with mectinite. And again, we'll get at least two seeds of control with mectinite. So, especially if we're talking about larger trees, you know, with two line chestnut borers and these really large oaks um, that might be stressed out due to whatever urban conditions we're forcing them to live in, um, part of our protocol, along with trying to make the tree healthy again through cultural control, can be wiping out that population and then protecting that tree against bronze birch borer or two line chestnut borer uh, for up to two seasons. Um, so again, just another 
option for using this. Now, the other thing I mentioned earlier was clear wing borers. So clear wing borers are actually lepidopteran. Um, so they are, again, related to butterflies and moths. Um, and many of you may know that our, a lot of our typical systemic products, um, like our neonicotinoids, like Zytec and Transtec, they're just not that effective on lepidopteran and clearing borers and lepidopteran. So we don't have a lot of systemic options for these pests. Um, and as you can see here, they emerge at different times. So if we look at two of our common clearing borers, ash lilac borer and lesser peace tree borer, ash lilac borer is coming out between 200 and 400 growing degree days, so pretty early on in the season. Lesser peace tree borer is coming out between 468 and 600 growing degree days, so a little bit later. And typically, we've managed these with bark sprays of our pyrethroids. Uh, now we have a celeprin, uh, which is labeled for these as well. Um, and so you had to be really dead on with your timing to prevent this from getting in the tree. So again, they would emerge. You are spraying the lower bark of the tree, the lower trunk slash limbs of the tree to coincide with these insects emerging, mating, and then laying eggs. And the idea is that you would kill the larvae before they're getting in the tree or killing the adults in some cases. Um, but again, if you have things like rain, wind, um, any number of conditions or issues that run that you run into uh, in a true operation out there, um, it can be difficult to get these sprays on and get them on accurately. Whereas with using M mectin benzoate, mectinite as a trunk injection, um, we're going to get again about two seasons, at least two seasons of control on these if the tree is large enough to inject, and this just helps us so much with operational efficiencies because again we can be there when the plant is at about three quarters leaf out do our injection walk away and be comfortable that you know we have that tree protected for at least two seasons some other insects that we run into now uh, especially are this group of ambrosia beetles um, and depending upon where you are you know along the southeastern coast we have a lot of problems with black twig borer which is a type of ambrosia beetle um, out west, of course, now in California, we have issues with polyphagous shot hole borer. Um, and so the biggest problem, especially with the polyphagous shot hole borer, is the fact that it'll vector a uh, pathogenic fungus into the tree. So this is where we talk about using mectinite in conjunction with these pests is this is part of a larger protocol. So what we want to do when managing ambrosia beetles is we want to definitely do our prophylactic sprays with our pyrethroids um, like Bifan XTS, our Tengard SFR. Make sure we're using the right rates because this is a question I get a lot or an issue I run into a lot of people use rates that are not, they're too low. They're not, they're using lower labeled rates than they should be. Um, but use these as a prophylactic spray and then you can do the mectinite as a trunk injection and this is some data from the University of Florida. And so you can see here, this is the um, number of mature stages that survived after treatment. And so while we're not killing the adults, this, the adults are still able to lay the eggs. Uh, we find that in this case here, in this trial, that none of the immatures were able to um, survive. And so what we're doing here is basically it's population control. Um, we're not and with m and benzoate alone or mectinite alone, we're not preventing the tree from being infected. What we are doing is we're taking out that next generation of insects. So as a combination protocol of prophylactic sprays along with the m and benzoate, especially for something like polyphagous shot hole borer, um, this can be a, a protocol that we can use to help manage that specific pest. So enough of boring insects, right? Let's move on to some other types of insects, uh, specifically here, caterpillars. Um, m mectin benzoate mectinite is phenomenal against caterpillars. Um, it works super well against caterpillars. Um, originally, I think even in agriculture where it was developed, it was its primary pest that it would manage with different types of caterpillar pests. Uh, so it works really well on caterpillars. Um, some of our common caterpillar pests, though, one is um, eastern tent caterpillar. This is a common caterpillar pest throughout the United States. It has one generation a year. Um, it can emerge very early on in the season. So again, very early on in the season, 
many places we have to deal with wind and rain. So now this gives us another opportunity to do a lower stem injection of our for 10 caterpillars, get it up into the plant again, about half to three quarters leaf out, and be very effective at managing these eastern tent caterpillars and not allowing them to get to a point where they're doing whole tree defoliation as we can see in many areas. Now again, sometimes it's just aesthetic and of course as part of this protocol, you could simply just remove the nest, um, you know, cut it out or damage it. But if it's a large tree, sensitive area, we can use mectinite and be very effective. And we'll look at some data here momentarily. But another caterpillar pest that is certainly an issue in the northeastern part and mid-Atlantic part of the United States is gypsy moth. Gypsy moth is another caterpillar pest that has one generation a year. If you've ever seen a gypsy moth outbreak, you just know how devastating this can be to our trees. Um, some of the difficulty with this uh, specific pest is that it has a pretty long feeding period. So it can feed and do damage for up to and including 40 days. So over a month, close to um, you know a month, month and a half of feeding. And as they get larger, they become more and more gregarious and more and more damaging. So again, these are often affecting large trees, trees in sensitive areas, spraying it can be really difficult sometimes. Uh, and again, as you see here, they begin emerging May or June in the mid-Atlantic. This is where we have a lot of rain, a lot of wind, sprays can be difficult. So this allows us now with mectinite to have another application time. Orange striped oakworm is another issue that we have specific down here in the southeast. Um, orange striped oakworm doesn't usually do too much damage, but it leaves this frass that, I mean, this, this size, this picture here is not far off from the size there. It's, they, once they get large, they get to be about the diameter of a thumb and like a human thumb. And they're pretty big and they can just leave a lot of frass and they become quite a nuisance. And people just are not a fan of this stuff landing all over their picnic tables and barbecues and things of that nature. Um, the difficulty here is they emerge late in the summer. So they emerge about 1800 growing degree days and they start off very small. So when they begin to feed, you hardly notice them. It's not until they get this large that they become an issue. So timing has always been an issue with trying to manage these pests, especially with things like foliar sprays. Um, but again, the beauty of um, mectinite is we can inject early on in the season and get control. And so as you guys know with caterpillars, we have a lot of different products that we can use. They're all very effective, but the issue becomes this. You know, this is a picture from my old neighborhood. We have a large maturing tree. You know, we have houses everywhere. This tree's canopy is over different yards. We have flowers out here, we can't see them here. Um, you know, we have little kids running and playing. Um, it just spraying large trees in these suburban areas just becomes such a challenge, uh, which is why we have something like mectinite. We also have, of course, Lepitec, which works phenomenally on Lepidopterin, a lot of these caterpillar pests. But if you look at your retreatment intervals here, you're looking at have to, having to retreat at 30 to 45 days, and you're looking at having to treat really close to that pest emergence. And so as we mentioned with some of these pests, it just becomes really a challenge to get out there and make these applications uh, to do that. Whereas with mectinite, we can do that root flare injection, um, we can do it up to two weeks prior, but really we can do it right beginning of the season. So as soon as we get um, leaf emergence to be about three quarters, we can start injecting mectinite, be very effective. And with foliar, now here is the distinction with foliar feeding insects, um, we're not comfortable in saying we're going to get two seasons of control. You're going to get a full season of control uh, with a springtime application of mectinite. And if we look at some of the data here, you know, when we look at the mechanite formulation, this is with um, eastern tent caterpillar that we looked at earlier on lindens, oaks, and birches, about 15 inches in diameter. If we look at our untreated and our treated with the mechanite formulation, over seven days, on average, um, we have over 10 caterpillars that survive on our untreated controls, where we have zero caterpillars that are surviving on our mectinite formulation injection. So again, this is a really effective product here 
If we look at gypsy moth, again, if we look at our untreated controls, an average of 18 caterpillars to revive over a seven day period with our mectinite formulation, we have less than one. We had half of a living caterpillar. He was mostly dead uh, caterpillar in that case there. Uh, if we look at gypsy moth, this is the trial that I participated in in cooperation with North Carolina State University and Dr. Frank in his lab. If we look at our mectinite versus our untreated control, and again, this is what we did here. We put them in these little petri dishes and we fed them trees that were treated. If we look at um, 48 hours after feeding, we had a little less than two caterpillars survive. Our untreated, um, we had no caterpillar, or excuse me, we had uh, 10 caterpillars, we had three and a half caterpillars survive, and we had all 10 caterpillars survive after two days of feeding on those. So again, very effective. Orange striped oakworm, again, so in this case here, these trees were treated early on in the spring, as soon as we had about half leaf out in this case. And then orange striped oakworm, we waited for them to emerge around 1900 growing degree days. We harvested them, we brought them into the lab, we fed them leaves. And again, what we find here after two days of feeding, we started out with nine uh, caterpillars in our untreated and eight caterpillars in our treated. Two days later, we had 7.8 caterpillars still alive and 1.8 caterpillars still alive in our treated. So very effective. And this is after only two days of feeding. Uh, when they start to get larger, they just they require more um, leaf material to eat before they perish. So very effective on these pests. Um, and a, it gives us this wide time frame to do the treatment in. The other thing we'll look at real quick here too is winter moth. Uh, for those of you again up in New England, you know winter moth can be such a big issue. Here we're looking at the mectinite formulation compared to other common applications here, and we're looking at percent mortality. Here again with our mectinite formulation, we're seeing close to 80% mortality, whereas with our other formulations here in our untreated control, we're seeing significantly less. So very, very effective on some of these. This was a trial, again, done here in Charlotte. This was with willow oaks. This was with um, cankworm. It's very similar to winter moth. Uh, here you can see our untreated trees here versus our tree injected with the mechanite formulation there. Uh, again, a picture still a thousand words. Now, what we have a real neat opportunity here is Japanese beetles. So especially Japanese beetles on things like lindens and some of these other larger trees. Um, we know that you know, we're having more and more restrictions um, on pesticides that we can use specifically on these linden trees. Um, and again, if you are in an area affected by Japanese beetle, you know uh, the damage they can cause. Um, phenologically speaking, they emerge just as linden flowers are dropping. Uh, and that is usually about, you know, 1,000 to 2,100 growing degree days. That's when those adults appear. Uh, you know, they have one generation a year. Most of the time they spend underground feeding on grass roots. Um, now again, spray treatments. We have spray treatments that are very effective for these pests, but uh, the issue becomes, again, larger trees, wind, suburban situations, and there's the stigma around foliar sprays in some parts of the country. We have a lot of great soil treatments or lower bark spray tree treatments too. Um, Lepitec is a great option as a soil option to manage these pests. Um, but again, when it comes to lindens, we do have restrictions on our neonicotinoids, and they specifically say when we talk about soil applications or sprays, do not apply this product by any application method to linden, basswood, or other tilia species. So we have great ways to manage this, this, these pests, but they're being taken away from us. Um, so that leaves us with tree injection. And again, you know, something like Lepitec works just phenomenally against them, but your timing has to be a lot dead on. Um, you have to be there um, at least or right around two weeks to a week prior to emergence to make sure if you're getting that. And again, you're only get 30 to 45 days of control. Whereas with methanite, you can be there early on in the spring, um, or you could be there. I neglected to mention this too, that methanite does move very quickly in the tree though. So if you can be, have such a wide window to where you could be treating at about half leaf out all the way to when you could be treating um, almost to pest emergence and still get control. And that's one of the beauties of methanite as well. Is just you have such a wide treatment window um, on especially for some of these damaging pests on large trees. So again, if we look at just some data here, if we look at our untreated controls and percent defoliation on linden, oak, and birch versus our mectinite formulation, 
we have close to, what is that, 70% defoliation on our untreated and around 10% defoliation on our treated. And of course, the insect needs to consume the leaf material to eventually perish. The last test that we'll talk about here, and then we'll open up for any questions that we may have, is spider mites. And so believe it or not, um, this works very well on spider mites as well. Um, it, Emectin benzoate is in the abomectin family. It's related to abomectin. Um, and so our spider mites, both warm and cool season spider mites, we get a full season of control when we use um, mectinite. And so again, as you guys know, we have both warm season mites and cool season mites. An example of some more warm season mites would be two-spotted mite, European red mite, oak spider mite, honey locust spider mites, boxwood spider mites. And this is where, you know, we might be able to get a one-two punch using mectinite. Uh, so examples of oak spider mite. So, you know, we have gypsy moth outbreak and we also have, you know, the potential for oak spider mite. So not only would we be treating for the gypsy moth, but we also be preventatively treating for oak spider mite. Likewise, honey locust spider mite. We had bagworm issues on honey locust. We knock out the bagworm, we knock out the spider mite. Um, just a one-two punch. So this is where we can get several pests with one injection of mectinite, um, so we can swing, hit two damaging pests, help the trees out. Um, again, we have a lot of different products that we can use from a foliar standpoint. Um, we have our new product on our line too, by Phenomite, which is a really great foliar applied miticide. Uh, has some ovicidal activity too. Um, if you're not familiar with Biphenomite, uh, especially for smaller plants, it would be a great opportunity there for your spider mite protocol. Um, but again, with our trunk injection um, products, we have mectinite, which gives us a full range of um, our mites that we can treat as well as some of these other pests. Uh, and again, it can be used in like a one-two punch for some of these um, pests out there. I mentioned this earlier on in the topic, we're about to conclude here and take some questions, but there are the, you know, again, mectinite is a trunk injected lower root flare, um, trunk flare injected product. Um, in 2016, ISA published the BMP in trunk injection, tree injection. This can be found here. You can go to their website and purchase that. Um, it was authored by Dr. Tom Smiley of the Bartlett Tree Research Laboratories and Rainbow's very own Sean Burnick, who is our uh, chief operating officer here at Rainbow. Um, so again, you know, talking about being science-based, honesty and integrity, um, you know, we are very, very much invested in making sure that everybody um, is managing trees and shrubs in the landscape correctly into the best management practices. One of the reasons why the um, Rainbow and Sean specifically uh, was asked to help co-author that um, publication. And so again, to wrap up here, you know, mectinite is a novel formulation of emectin benzoate, low viscosity, um, works really well. Mectinite is ideally applied using plugless injection equipment because of that low viscosity. Um, and of course, mectinite is effective on a broad range of common landscape tests, as you get the one-two punch on some of these tests. Um, just so you guys know, we do have, depending upon where you are in the country, we have some workshops coming up. So here in August, we'll be doing an EAB workshop out in Denver, Colorado. We'll be doing a series of tree healthcare workshops in the New England area, here in Wellesley, um, and there in Connecticut at the Bartlett Arboretum. Uh, and then, of course, as I mentioned, Leading Branches is coming up on September 18th, so please check that out. Um, we have a whole list. We have a whole team out there to provide you support. So we have regional territory managers throughout the country um, to help you. So if you see your state highlighted and you don't know that person, uh, give them a call. Um, you can also find this map on our website. Um, and of course, we provide a whole host of diagnostic field guides. And I have spoken enough now. So Matt, if we have any questions, I will take them now. All right. Thanks, Patrick. We do have a few questions that are flying in. And the first one is, uh, is this product effective for hemlock woolly adelgid? That's a great question. So emmectin benzoate does not seem to be that great on piercing and sucking insects like 
true bugs, aphids and adelgids, you'll find them on the label. Um, but it would not be my first choice for those. It's just, when you look at trial data, it's going to kill some of them, um, but it's not going to be a star. So for things like our piercing sucking insects, So aphids, adelgids, white sloths, um, I would be looking still at um, our neonicotinoids like Transpect or Zypec for systemic options. Put that up. <laughs> All right. Uh, next one is uh, Mr. Part. What was the best tool to use uh, to inject mectinite with? So that comes down to um, preference as well as test. So um, most of our clients and our service team prefers to use the Q-Connect. Um, that is the harness system where you apply pressure using a bicycle pump. They, um, specifically for Emerald Ash Borer, that's what their preference is. That seems to be what most people's preference is. Um, other people really like using the IQ infuser. Myself, I've used the IQ infuser a lot um, to inject uh, the mesonite formulation, and I like that. Uh, so it comes down to preference. Um, but I would say, you know, probably number one, if you talk to most people, they'd say the Q-Connect uh, followed closely by the IQ infuser. Okay, next question. Any idea when this will be labeled for Washington State? That is a great question. And Matt, if you could get that person's information, we will uh, talk to our regulatory person and let them know. I can definitely take care of that. All right, uh, next you. question is, I think this one's centered around TransTect. Um, why can't they treat for lindens? Does it harm the tree or is it just because of the pollinators? Uh, just curious why those trees are not to be treated other than it is on the label. Sure, the linden question is, um, it is because of uh, concerns with pollinators. Um, it is a long story. Um, but it is a, a uh, it was kind of a reactionary uh, label amendment, I guess you would say, by the EPA. Um, it was some time ago now. I don't know exactly when. At least maybe anywhere from three to five years, maybe a little bit more. But that is a reactionary um, thing there with the neonicotinoids um, and linden. So just to be aware of. All right. Under ideal conditions, how many days till full uptake? Under ideal conditions, so I'm, um, you should start seeing, I, I have seen um, efficacy within, I want to say, two weeks. Uh, it may have been a little bit sooner. Um, with most of the, the trials that I do, I always go back after two weeks just to do a quick evaluation. And so um, this is with orange stripe oak worm. I was finding dead orange stripe oak worms within two weeks of application. Um, as just a note too, when, with trunk injection in general, um, you will see efficacy or um, you'll see distribution in the crown a lot faster than when you do soil applications. Obviously, mechanite is not a soil application, but if you look at something like um, Zytex is a good example. Zytex 10% makes it up into the tree and gets distribution into the tree uh, within a you know few weeks versus when you do the soil application of Zytex, it can be you know several weeks to months. All right, next question we got is what is the cost per quart of mectinite? That's a great question. I would direct you to your local territory manager. And again, Matt, if you would take that person's information, we will make sure that um, their territory manager gets a hold. Can do. And the last one I think is looking for an application for Japanese beetle on roses. Sure, so roses are a tough one because they uh, bloom, like especially knockout roses will bloom continually. Um, so that is where there is data to show that um, acelaprin as a fuller application uh, would work well. And that, of course, is um, supposedly not toxic to bees, or at least less toxic to bees. Don't quote me specifically on toxicity, but um, less toxic to bees for sure. Uh, there's also data support you can do that as a soil injection for roses as well. Um, so that would be an option for your roses. Uh, Celeprin, as far as um, you know, around bloom time, and um, you know, trying to preserve pollinators. 
Okay, looks like we got one more. Uh, are there any decay issues from annually drilling into the tree? Oh, that's a great question. The annual drilling into the tree. Um, so ideally, you would want to you know, only drill every other year. With emerald ash board, certainly you can drill. Um, you don't only need to inject every two seasons. Um, now, in Rich's presentation um, yesterday on our ash board, he covered over on this and showed a great example of trees that have been repeatedly um, injected. Uh, so, so at least when it comes to, you know, some things like elms and ash trees, uh, that at this point we have a very large sample set because the amount of elms we've injected for Dutch elm disease and the amount of ashes we've injected for um, emerald ash borer, we don't see very many negative effects when the application is made correctly. Now, caveat being, you know, we're looking at three and two year injections, respectively, three for DED, two for m lash bore. Um, we just, we see that the plant is able to compartmentalize those injection sites really well and done, um, uh, either every two seasons to every three seasons. Every year, I don't know what the data is out there. Um, certainly, we don't see too many people doing that, but of course, we did cover over on some tests that you would maybe need to do that every year for if you're going to utilize mectonite. Um, so um, I would say right now, a vigorous tree should be able to seal those wounds no problem. Um, you know, when you start getting the trees that are less vigorous, uh, maybe on the, the the downside of their their life cycle, their life uh, expectancy, that's where you might want to be more judicious in um, doing injections every year. But that's a, a good question without a great answer right now. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, I think that is it. Um, for all those you have attended, we have the ISA um, certification numbers that you have uh, supplied us with. So I will turn that into ISA. <clears throat> Usual turnaround time, they say, is about four to six weeks. So if you don't see anything after that, feel free to give us a call and we can look into uh, what the holdup is. Uh, I do have those other two uh, attendees that ask questions. Uh, we'll be reaching out to you shortly after this once I get that out to the correct people. Uh, other than that, uh, thanks for attending and have a great rest of the day. Thanks everybody for your attention today. Look forward to hopefully seeing you here someday soon out there in your neck of the woods. Have a great one.